everybody ready? Because just okay. So just everybody's aware. So as I said, what, what actions would one even begin to consider if we were to attempt a transition towards a devout spirituality such as our ancestors espoused? And I say devout spirituality because um, this idea that seems to be readily accepted within much of these pagan communities, pagan, heathen, Austria, Norse paganism, whatever the hell you want to call it, is that, well, I, I, I can kind of make it up as I go. I really don't need uh, this or that or, or guidance or uh, I'll read this book or I'll have that book. Um, but the problem with that is, is that it wasn't a bunch of individuals who thought they were going to do it on their own that built the great megalithic monuments all over Northern Europe. It wasn't a bunch of people that thought, hey, I'm just, I'm going to, well, I'll do this over here on my own and, uh, well, let's get together and build Goblecky Tepe. Um, let's build Stonehenge. I got an idea. Let's build a fucking pyramid. That ain't how that worked. If you, if you look at, and I'm going to tell you all this to tell you something else. If you look at all of these things, if you look closely at it, you will see that every community had some kind of spiritual leader, some nature that provided guidance, purpose, and direction. Now, was there dogma? Mm, it's a good possibility. But when you got home, one of the things it says in our lore is that when a man came home, he had the responsibility of being a spiritual leader in that house. That's a powerful thing of responsibility to assume that role as a man in a home. Because when you walk through the door, you can cast the runes. You can do these things. The vulva can come to your house and sing songs and work magic um, in your home. But there was a foundation of what we could expect following this faith, this faith and this spirituality. And for 10,000 years, at least in Europe, we know that it worked. We know that it provided positive purpose, guidance, and direction for millions of people. Now, I would submit to you that that would be nigh impossible if everybody's running around going, well, I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do that, because I think I'll pick this Greek god over here to kind of put, because I like the way they operate. Oh, you know what? That Egyptian one over there, that's really cool. Now, that's not to say Isis was not prominent in Europe. She was a powerful goddess, and indeed, she morphed into the Virgin Mary as Christianity began to take over. Now, as our ancestors lived when they built empires, so they, this devout spirituality such as our ancestors espoused, not really as our ancestors lived, they lived as a part of their life, as a part of their being. We cannot confuse the way we live with the Sunday school aspect of Christianity. There's a real breakdown of that. Uh, with what we're trying to do today, when they built empires, fought wars, celebrated life, sought out the challenges of the earth and the sea. Because I think that surely there was something powerful in those old ways that provided them more than just hope. Are we acting in a manner as a whole that allows us to have something more than just hope? This observation and all that I've discussed are not new. The idea that the Bible is a fabrication, which it is, composed of other, more ancient ideas is gaining ground. But why the difference between gods and men? So Joseph Campbell, everybody knows him, and I've talked about him several times, the celebrated mythologist, proposed the idea of the monomyth. Okay? This is an important thing to pay attention to because he surmised that every journey of every hero fits the same pattern. Okay? I talked about it a little bit last week, and I'm going to go a little more in depth this week. Now, heck her head. But here's the deal. I don't know everything about it. So how can I write about it if I can't get input? So what I would like to do today as we talk about these things, as I review some of the things that I've written, some of the things that I haven't, let's get some input from all of you. Because you guys might have a different perception of it than I do. And it may not be the same thing. It may be radically different. I don't know what it takes to be a woman going through these things. I have some ideas, but I don't know. <clears throat> so there, the, 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 the hero's journey are, are as follows, okay? Hey, Bob. Yes. I wanted to, I guess, speak up before the topics get more involved. Yes. Um, on this whole subject, um, I'd like to say a couple of things, even if it's just running in my mouth in ignorance, but I think we were kind of under the spell of Christianity 
And those of us that woke up to it understood that it was like living in a false home. And I think we all go through a phase of fierce individuality okay. when we're branching away from it. But then those of us who come back into the fold with the community, I believe, understand wholly that no man is an island. And as far as the spiritual leaders and leader or not, the whole point of it is, I mean, I would guess to be more like the gods, as close to the gods as we can be. And if the gods did great and glorious things, you know, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Um, first coming into Asatru, I'm very new, you know, but the first thing I heard heard before even the I knew about the Asatru Folk Assembly was the Nine Noble Virtues. And I know, you know, that's kind of just made up, but. Um, be careful. So the Nine Noble Virtues are based, the Odinicrite went through the lore and the sagas and everything else. And those are the things that identified that they identified as repeated ideas throughout all of our all, all of our literature. So those nine noble virtues were repeated again and again and again, and they codified them. And quite frankly, I look at them, I'm challenged to find a better pattern. Well, I agree. Yeah. I'm not so, saying that they're not good. I'm right. saying it's natural to me. There and I go. feel to a lot of us, it's like coming home. So I, I do understand that, that, I mean, if you put it in, in a layman's terms, we don't want to be suckered again. Because, I mean, that's really the, when you come out of something like that, when you wake up from this and you, and you go through whatever event you've gone through to change the spiritual foundation of your life, we don't want to be suckered again. And it's very difficult to shake that much, a lot of the knee-jerk reaction against some of the things that occur are very much scar tissue left over from these things, of these abuses of, of Christianity. It's a real double-edged sword. All of the tales in the Old Testament are repeated from much older sources, every single one of them. The entirety of the story of Christ is a repetition of no less than 13 different ancient deities that I'm personally aware of. That I wrote about in the first chapter. So they took all of our framework and built something and put somebody else in charge of it. Now you have this intercessor. You can only access the very best of who and what you are because it resides out there somewhere. If this person over here says you have permission, it's a scary thought to be free of that and then say and then find out that well, maybe I do need a little guidance. When all of our lives We've been suckered by some horseshit somebody come up with to make money. Very well, I think that I think that the Christianity aspect of it is that um, people are, I don't want to say weak, but weak of mind because they want someone else to take responsibility for all of the things. I'm not responsible. Uh, that's sin. Uh, I'm not responsible. That, you know, God's responsible for that. Oh, it's not my works. It's his works. We want, you know, the the premise of we don't want to be responsible for anything and then one day you wake up and you realize i'm going to use this analogy we when mine and jr's kids were little when our oldest daughter was little um i was buying christmas presents and i was putting santa's name on the biggest christmas presents and putting them underneath a tree and my husband said why the hell is santa getting all the glory for the big <laughs> I can see Randy saying that shit too. <laughs> and, and I and I sat back and I looked at him and I was like, well I don't know. That's just what we're supposed to do. And at that point we realized our children are not going to believe in Santa. And so I think that Christians are like that. You know, they wake up and they're like, wait a minute. Uh no, God didn't do I did this. I worked 80 hours a week. I built this house. I paid for these this cushions on these couches. I paid for the electric bill. Um, and so it's, it's a matter of, in Bible speak, it's going from milk to meat. Um, and that's how they teach the Bible. Um, you get the milk and then you grow up and then you eat the meat. So that's, that's my stance on it is that, you know, 
you go to Christianity, one, because it's comfortable, right? Um, your mom probably was a Christian and her mama was a Christian and you just went to church and that was what was done. And then all of a sudden you realize, I am not, I don't fit in here. I don't believe any of this. And then you leave and you're ostracized by that community. Um, and then you're just out floating, <laughs> right? Until, until you yeah, find something else. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, uh, I don't know for you guys, but for me, like the nine number vir virtues, I was like, I resonate with every single one of these. And so that was one of the major turning points. So, okay. yeah. So that's the first step in the, in the, in the hero's journey. So if we Correct. try to find, so the, it's the ordinary world. This is the original world of the hero, which suffers from a symbolic deficiency. The hero is lacking something or something is taken from him. So if we, we take a look at that, so let's see here. So these are the kind of thoughts that I came up with, and you may or may not agree. Um, well, let me say this real quick. So in a world, there's no longer such calls to adventure, right? There's nobody saying, nobody blowing a horn saying, go, motherfuckers, let's get it on, right? We more often than find a lot of people are stuck at step one. We're aware of the deficiency no clue what to do with it and yet every day people like us is becoming more and more of us a real powerful thing is happening right um but but you've got to remember there's confusion and various other methods to befuddle this into uh no direction is ever really cast and it's a recurring thought of mine that this is a failure to launch it's primarily a misunderstanding of the call Right? We have become accustomed to the various tales, both ancient and modern, that such venues for adventure will take place in some fantastic time and location. And yet for all our yearning to adventure, we have failed to recognize that the horizon that beckons us is a spiritual one, just like you were talking about, Patricia. We begin to recognize this failing. Hey, wait a minute now. And here's where we may discern the division between the heroes of folklore and mythology of the gods. So the ordinary world. Okay, so first thing we're doing is dealing with a loss of faith. And that is always most certainly a wound. I don't know exactly where that wound originates, but it is a wound. And it leaves us uncomfortable, restless, bitter, and easily manipulated. Now, there's another aspect of this as well. We usually come to such a crossroads in pain. We have lost someone, or perhaps we have lost ourselves in old wars, prisons, drugs, so on and so forth. Suffice it to say, we feel that hole within us. That dull, nagging ache or thought process, or maybe even the anger we use as fuel internally. But men in particular are not well suited at handling or navigating the emotional states of being we have been told exist, right? Sometimes a broken heart and all the confusion associated with it manifests in any number of ways. We build our defenses, but those walls also keep us right here, aware of the deficiencies, but not unable or unwilling to do anything about it. And then, then we come face to face with it. So as Robert Johnson points out in his work, he, Understanding Masculine Psychology, an interesting phenomenon occurs when a man is very young or not really even a man at all. Okay, so um, bear with me. I may digress a little bit, but I'll get back to what we're talking about. <clears throat> he is sorely wounded by a young woman. Sometimes it's the mother. Now, unsure of how to treat the wound, he simply forms a protective barrier around it, similar to scar tissue. But about 40, most men are visited by some aspect of the crime, right? And I think uh, I think uh, the Celtic tales, the Morgan is real fun. She's real good about showing up like that. Most men are visited. He comes to a moment which forces him to examine his fare to successfully navigate and heal his wound. This is an old story. It's outlined in King Arthur when the land and the king are one. And as the emotionally wounded king suffers from the pain of losing Guinevere, he suffers and so does everyone around him. To recover, he must take up arms against the tyrant, mewling child of his youth. He visits the woman who so wounded him to reclaim the powerful phallic symbol of the sword. And most men never accomplish this. Failed relationships, disappointments are found in the wounded man's life. Bitterness is the nectar of his heart. It is a wound which creates a failure to successfully launch the life of a man. We feel this subconsciously, somewhere, somehow. It becomes apparent in how we talk, how we act, how we think how we think about women. His, great, his greatest dragon to slay resides within his own breast. The breaking of such a cycle is outlined beautifully in Ode's sacrifice of himself to himself. Only then may he reclaim the throne 
hear the to hear the songs of his ancestors gather the runes. In King Arthur's case, he's mortally wounded and returns the Excalibur to the Lady of the Lake. Now, obviously, these are noteworthy legendary examples, but to a greater or lesser extent, these are the things every man deals with. For the feminine, we find that great struggle, which is the symbolic death of the maiden to become the matriarch. Weddings are as much a funeral for the maiden as they are birthing of the new matriarch of the family, Johnson, 1989. Such is the nature of the sometimes bitterness between mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law. The husband is always the harbinger of death to a maiden. Think about that. <clears throat> Such a difficult and complex, sometimes traumatizing ordeal for any woman to attempt to negotiate. Any man who attempts to intervene or pretend as if he has proper knowledge to help navigate the situation, who does not have a plethora of experience and learning, stands as much chance as he would against an earthquake or a tidal wave before it consumed him. It is truly such an ethereal, esoteric, and spiritual journey, making these and other feminine transitions, that the states of being have been immortalized as the three norms, or fates, or in the case of negative experience, the furies. <clears throat> All of them deal out life and death on a wholesale level, the maid, the woman, and the crone. Where are the instructions in this day and age when youth and beauty are all that seem value to help a woman make these healthy transitions in life? Such are the things that every woman must contend with. If we possess the ability to notice these states of being in either as either a man or a woman, we may notice that there are a few things amiss. While there are not necessarily any female heroes, their call to journey into the realm of the spirit is every bit as powerful as a man. We all begin to feel as if something is wrong. This is the call. And I put those two examples in there as relationship-based because more often than not, it is the loss of someone we love that brings us to this crossroads powerfully enough to say, I got to find something better. I got to find something new to believe. In. I got to answer this call. This is the call. This is the, this is the, the ordinary world. This is where the original world of the hero, which suffers from a symbolic deficiency. We're suffering from some kind of deficiency. The hero is lacking something or something is taken from him. And I think at the very basic of levels, we can all identify with those types of pain. Things change. People move on. Everything becomes different. <clears throat> when I was a folk builder, I one time had nine states, I was covering two or three regions. And this was in 2012, 2013. When any, whenever I would reach out to call somebody and ask them, all right, what's going on? Usually there was something going on, some kind of transition, but there was also usually 70% of them as a conservative estimate would say that there was a dream that brought them into this path that even gave them the idea that I can do something different than keep waiting on someone else to take care of my problem for me. Uh, I imagine if we asked this group, there would also be a similar response. I had some kind of dream. I don't remember really what it was, but you know, I had this kind of a wild dream. It sparked enough of our imagination to want to look for something better. This is our, this is our stepping away from the ordinary world. Any thoughts? Because I'm going to write them down. Huh. For me, it wasn't a dream, more like the waking nightmare of modern civilization. There's and that. The need to re. The th I guess it was more of a thought there has to be something better. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. I, I do. Yeah. Before we get too far from a couple, two, three paragraphs ago, um, I wanted to say, because you were talking about, you know, Christians fresh off, well, ex-Christians, fresh ex-Christians on their, mm -hmm. on their way out. Um, I feel like when you're a Christian, it's kind of like being in the passenger seat of your, of your own car. Oh, hell yeah. Jesus, take the wheel. Come on, brother. <laughs> Bastards. But being also true is accepting responsibility. That puts you in the driver's seat, which is incredibly terrifying but it's freeing at the same time, liberating, because you can look in the mirror and say, okay, what can I do about this? And then from that point, you start building your own personal power. Um, I'd also say that I'm pretty confident everybody here on this Zoom, at least most of the people in the AFA, have realized that 
even though you know Christianity and the Bible was taken from multiple different sources, we know how good they are at taking what is good and inverting it. So I think, yes, we might have been a bit jaded from the way that things were, but I still think we had an inner knowing that there is some goodness in there among the crap. And we just got to bring it back. Well, we, we cannot deny that somewhere in that message that resonates, there are still 3.2 billion Christians in the world that seem to have a handle on things. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe it's uh, just a service officer cursory examination, but they at some point are finding positive purpose, guidance, and direction in these modern dressed up tales of ancient myths. And I think one of the greatest challenges that we have is finding out what is that? The only thing we really got to do is take away the idea that I have to wait for permission to be great. I think that's one of the things that, that, that for me, Austria really offered is I, I don't have to wait for anybody's permission to be as great as I feel like I can be. Oh, you're a dumbass redneck, like a, talks like a slack jaw yokel. I'll write a book. <laughs> okay. Hey, man, there's two people in the world I don't underestimate. That's weed scientists. <laughs> red I hate that the truth. Yeah, red exactly right. Dreams. Number two. So, that, I mean, so there's, there is, there's that. And I think, I think we would become aware of, of what's amiss. And it really is something we really feel like something's missing. And I get a kick out of that. Peace Cell song by Megadeth. I remember listening to that as a as a teenager when the album first came out. And just thinking about that. Now here I am, you know, at fifty one, almost fifty two. Um, hell, I did it, <laughs> and it cracks me up. I laugh about it every time I think about it. But there's a new way, it better work this time. Well, that it better work this time relies entirely upon me. But this first step of the hero's journey is recognizing that something is wrong. And I think for that, the removal of responsibility and there has to be something better. And I think those are powerful things that need to be discussed amongst ourselves. What was it that we recognized that, that was amiss in our lives? Was it Santa getting the credit for the gifts? We're the ones out there busting our ass for it. Um, <clears throat> why did we carry that forward? Why is that still with us? What is it about that that, that, that builds healthy, healthy children? What is, because it's been around for thousands of years. Um, is, it, uh, is it the teaching of the rudimentary basics of faith? Yeah, and I, and I have to wonder about that. I have to, I have to think about that, that, that this very idea is, okay, this is where we teach our children the rudimentary basics of faith. If we're good, we get a reward. Now, that's simplifying it kind of like training a dog, but we have to realize there's 7 billion people in the world, and we do have to operate in a society until such time as it crashes, which it seems like it could do any given day now. Um, there's a way to operate, with, and there's a number of tools we might use to build ourselves into successful individuals, but I, but I digress. Removal of responsibility, and there has to be something better with regards to discovering something is amiss in our lives. Um, for me, it was drug addiction, divorce, those kinds of things. <clears throat> um, sitting in a closet, smoking crack, I'm wondering if your heart's going to blow up, knowing that the cops are going to look in the window at you because they've already busted you once. Um, there will always be, hopefully, I hope that those people that still suffer, I hope that that moment of clarity that there has to be something better leads them to these doors where they begin to find that, hey, I can do better. Because that's what it's done for me. Because I, I promise you, I've come a hell of a long way since I was 35, 36 years old. Be that as it may. Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? That idea of noticing that something is amiss as we begin to look for something new? I think I have a couple thoughts. Go for it, brother. So one of the things that kind of reminds me of is um, I've been doing a lot of, um, I guess you could say, reading in the in the broader tradition of uh, 
of our people a um, bit outside the traditional Germanic sphere, but you see a lot of crossovers in thought, I find. And uh, one of the things it reminds me of is this idea you find among some of the philosophers of like the late Greeks or even um, like uh, Advaita Vedanta, that there's a, a kind of ever deepening illusion as the uh, age of darkness continues on and mm -hmm. it kind of it kind of fosters in people that have any type of spiritual intuition that they kind of need to go in the opposite direction of it and um to me it seems the obvious i, I guess this this could have been my thinking at the time that it seems the obvious um answer to that type of internal struggle and that type of like uh a discomfort with the situation of the world is to look at history and say, what is the exact opposite of this transition that we see taking place? Which of course would be ancient tradition. The embracing of ancient tradition, yes, I agree. There's a there's a line in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that, that says that as they begin to develop sobriety, that they will recoil from it as if from a hot flame. And as you were talking, about being aware of these of these failures in society, I wonder if that might not be uh, might not be something inherent in in our in our in our cultural heritage to notice these things because we're not the only ones that are noticing them. You have you have people following Greek traditions in Greece. You have the Slavs of Novri. They're you know they're fully embracing their spiritual heritage. Uh, even in Central America and Mexico, you're seeing a, a rebirth and a reinterest in their spiritual traditions. And it's, it's not, so I think there's a lot of credence to what you say because we're not, it's not an ice, it's not an anecdotal example. It's happening in many different cultures. Of course, the Hindus and the Shinto in Japan, that's always there. Go ahead, Melissa. <clears throat> I was just going to say that. It is. It's on the. It's on the rise. Watching everybody find the root of who they are, and at the same time that that is happening, there's a great pushback. Though, you know, we've seen it on Facebook with the AFA when they took everybody out. We, we, everybody in leadership and all of the pages, they just no, no warning, just took them out. And I remember talking with somebody on a different social media site, and she was from Lithuania. And she was like, it's happening with us too. She's like, our, when we talk about our indigenous faiths, they, they delete us. And then it started growing from there. You started seeing that it's happening all the way around the world. Like there is a pushback because, you know, we talked about earlier, there's that, uh, that freedom and that knowing at that moment that you are responsible and that you have the power for your own life and to, to uh, harness that greatness within and what you're going to do with it. And it's almost like there's other people out there that are like, no, don't let them know they have the power. <laughs> true. It's true. And well, it's, there's entire organizations built to stymie such events. I mean, like I say, we, we, you know, we deal with so many things uh, and we're bombarded 24 seven with news channels. Um, or government propaganda or the people at work or whatever. But this is, so this is what brings us to the call to adventure. This is what brings us to the call to begin this journey. And this is a real simple one so, so far. I have fleshed it out completely, but the hero is given a challenge, problem, or adventure. We have a challenge, we have a problem, and we have an adventure all in one. And often it appears as a blunder or a chance. We stumble upon it. This stage establishes the goal of the hero. And this is where I think maybe we have failed. We haven't established the goal of what our journey should look like. And this is where we tumble upon the fringe elements of faith in our society. Austro, Kematism, Hellenistic, uh, Rodnavri, the list goes on and on. It's a bunch of them. Some would refer to it as a calling. I don't know if it is or not. For some, I'm sure, very sure that it is. But here it is, the beginnings of a call towards a new horizon. This one we didn't even know existed. It is the beauty of this blunder and all that we might witness in an instant of the possibilities it offers that acts like a lightning rod to those who are ready. Be it from pain or any other standard of chaos that affects our lives. 
The glimpse of something different opens the door if only a fraction to the possibility that there is another way. It is the hero given a challenge, problem, or adventure. Often it appears as a blunder or chance. This stage establishes the goal of the hero. I think we got the first part. I wonder about the second part. What you got, Randy? You guys hear me okay, or is that too noisy? We can run with it, brother. All right, then. Well, um, you keep saying that, you know, like we, you know, we're searching for our next journey. We're searching, you know, I, I keep hearing that. But it, it keeps pondering back to me is that, I mean, if you think about it, you know, Odin was known as the wanderer. There's a reason he was wandering. He's looking for his next, you know, his next thing. He's trying to be better, you know, everything else. And that's where I look at it is that I believe that we're not lost. We're just, we're just trying to go to the next step. And if we're not, if we're not wandering around and we're just stalemate, and we're like, oh, we're good. That's when there's something wrong. When you have that 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 energy of I'm not finished. I, there's something else I need to do. You know, everything else. I believe that that is what it is to be more godlike and be more like Odin or whatever. Because Odin was always searching for more knowledge, more magic, more things. And if we're not doing it, we're not searching for that next step. If we're not doing that, then we're in a stalemate. And we might as well be Christians if we're in a stalemate. We're comfortable. We don't care. And that's where I was getting at with it. I'm sorry. I see what you're saying. And to a, to an extent, I, I agree with it. The the idea of wondering. And the first, when, as soon as you said that, I thought of J.R.R. Tolkien. Not all those who wonder are lost. But that's one of the reasons I call it a spiritual horizon. A horizon is something we move towards. And there's a lot of things we got to do to move towards that horizon. Um, ideas that we see promoted on, on social media, and news, and all these other things, these are the things that stick us in place, that stop our wandering. We call them rabbit holes for a reason. We get lost in them as we begin to journey forward, or we trip in them, or we stumble, or we, we fail to continue forward momentum towards a horizon we might view as something truly special. Bjorn, you still want to, you had something? Well, it's kind of a, all right, since I got you anyway. Go for it. It's kind of funny, kind of serious when you're talking about Odin being the wanderer and whatnot and how we kind of sort of do the same thing. Something just popped in my head real quick. Quick question, your opinion. What's the difference between a Faustian drive and ADHD? <laughs> um. Because uh, one's, one's caused by immunizations and one's caused by a sickness in your soul. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think I, I'd be willing to. I'd be willing to volunteer at least a tentative answer on that. Go for it. Um, so, if you look at um, like dope, really though. ancient psychology, if you want to call it that, um, one of the one of the ancients that wrote about mental illness, I guess you could call it that, and virtue both. Uh, Aristotle. And so one of the things he addresses is that uh, virtue is the mean between an excess and a deficiency. So for example, courage, courage is the mean between rashness and cowardice, just a, just an example. So I guess to answer that question, the, the basic way to address it would be um, it's not taken to an extreme. Um, these things have a, an appropriate measure of things. That's a good point. That's a good point, a valid point, absolutely. What is the appropriate measure of wandering? So, so I that, guess uh, the first thing that comes to mind is it's kind of like the like the physical parallel to it. You want to have an, an, a mind that's open, but not so open your brain falls out. But um, yeah, you don't, you don't want to be stuck. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase the problem all here because I'm too ignorant to remember the actual quote, but um, it, you know, there's there's nothing virtuous about someone who only knows their own home, who who knows nothing of the ways of the world, who's who's seen no no further uh, things afield. But at the same time, um, if if you have no 
no standard to measure foreign things against, new experiences against, new challenges against, it can drive you mad. So this, this is at the heart of everything we're doing. This entire discussion, this book, is everything we're talking about here. When we're all talking about wonder. We're all talking about spiritual horizons where we're all kind of, hey, there is something new and amazing to, to look to, to search for, some something. No one has ever sat down and suggested what that end goal might look like. And without that basic unit of comparison, where do we go? So that's why I invited everybody to talk about it. Okay, so what, what should it look like? What well, Brian, I think that's an individual thing. Yeah, because my goals are not your goals. Your goals aren't my goals. Um, at the end of the day, right? You are more outgoing than I am. I'm more comfortable sitting at home. Um, whereas, say, you know, Melissa's more comfortable out wandering and doing the things. I'm comfortable, you know, feeding the fires at home and feeding people, and and that's my goal is to is to do those things. So I think that's an individual stance more so than a collective. I can see that. I can see that. That's that's a valid thing, and I think that breakdown is where we, we get lost with regards to the, the, the gothi of the past and the man being the spiritual leader in the home and still we haven't figured out how to make that healthy connection there to value this individual momentum for growth or to identify is this healthy within the manner that we attend, uh, intend to pursue it. I think that's a very valid point. We, we, we cannot lose sight of the forest and trees and all that nonsense. Uh, Don, Don, I think you had your hand up first. You had something to say. Yes, sir. I, the topic changed a little bit, but uh, speaking to... I lost you. Okay. To what you were talking about just a few minutes ago about, uh, you know, I'm found another man, you know, joy in man. In other words, I think that's a sharing of wisdom there, kind of like what we're doing here. Right. And, um, you know, I'm not sure that after he found that person and tilted his cup and shared that loaf that he was no longer, you know, lost or wandering, but there is a sense of joy there that I know I have felt when I've been traveling, uh, you know, on my motorcycle or what have you around the country, meeting new people, new folk, uh, but again, for me, at the end of the day, going back to my own history of being raised, my mom was Catholic, you know, nominally. My dad was Methodist nominally. So uh, then I married someone in the Worldwide Church of God, which is like a Seventh-day Adventist cult, you know. And <laughs> after a year of that, I had enough of that shit and I got out. But um, and then we were arguing about, you know, Christmas. And I was like, there's no way my kids aren't getting a Christmas. And, you know, kind of got into Wick a little bit. And she was off put about that. So ever since that time for me and my family paganism was like a, a rough road and had i had the option of also true at that time as opposed to just like we were all talking about earlier oh there's all these christian things and that's all you know and that's all you know what to do and then you're lost what are you then agnostic atheist or whatever you know finally i found you know us true uh, a little bit about the trough it just wasn't too sold on it you know so i yeah. thought it was still too wiccan and um so until i found the afa and and saw you know that this is like the real deal you know not just dancing around sky clad in a circle or what have you mm -hmm. um, i just you know i don't know where i was going with that <laughs> but, I don't know, but you, but you uh, made you know. a really you made a really good point with this fellowship of man i mean that's one of the things um I wonder if that's one of the things we should consider as a benefit of this of this spirituality is or are the strengths and bonds of these friendships and, and fellowships between men that have met each other and shared a horn. It's you know, fun. I think it's not a grand, you know, burning bush kind of thing, but but in a sense it kind of is because I know I've been fucking alone sometimes and I didn't like it, but I wasn't enough of a man or a person to fix it. And I wonder if that's something we should consider. You know what? I'm going to flesh that out. That's a that's a really that's a good point. That's a good point. Justin, what you got, brother? 
so what that makes me think of um well i do i can add to that and i'm sorry go ahead sir oh sorry about that my i'm lagging here so i was just saying until i started pushing that um in my family you know my son wore the hammer for a while and things like that it helped but like i say the problem is when you have all these extraneous uh you know christian or what have you elements pulling you this way or that way it, it can be really tough out there can and like you say that's there's your fellowship you know once you find a brother once you find somebody that that meets the standard of calling each other brother i should say that, that damn that's a really good point Okay, Justin, let's give it a shot again. All right, well, I, I just wanted to add to that, um, that what it made me think of was, because uh, one of y'all asked earlier, what is the measure of wandering? And I think the measure of, a good measure of wandering is to not lose your reference point, you know, because it's good to, you know, go off into the wilderness and explore, but if you wander so far that you get completely lost and then you're not going to be able to do yourself or anyone else any good and um you know to me that's kind of the point of religion is to have a good reference point and one of the things that appealed to me about Osetru was that um you know it, it it respects the sciences and nature and what we can see and experience with our own eyes while at the same time not being an extremely rigid religious system with strict commandments it, it allows you to wander a little bit and to make your own interpretations in some ways without without losing your reference point that is a that is a good point you know tear tear being the, the north star and a, a guiding light for instance that's a really good point. And it is referenced, but I don't think we referenced that enough. Jordan, what do you think, brother? Uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you, I Matt. I appreciate that. Um, you talked about, real quick, I want to talk about the first point, which is basically recognizing the issue. What's yes. wrong? Was something wrong? Right. I, I think the second part is beginning to figure out how to deal with that issue, the response okay. to that issue. But it was just a little thing. The, the other thing I want to talk about, um, I think individuality is a very good and healthy thing. But I, think, autonomy, yes. but I think taken to an extreme, it can be very unhealthy. And not only that, it can isolate you from help. Um, I guess I think we need to figure out how to Com combine the individual with the collective and have them both be positively symbiotic, working together and helping each other out. And I got, I wrote down here, should we even create a collective goal? Who are we to say, you know, this is what also true is going to do end goal. Not, I'm not talking about what each person is doing in their own house. I'm talking like collectively all of us. And I'd like to point you brought up about brotherhood and sisterhood because that loneliness factor is a big deal. Morale is a big deal. And I think we have the how, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. I think we have the why. I don't think we have the how. And I think that's why we're still, we're, we're excessively wandering. Some of us are excessively wandering because we don't have that point of perspective. We're, we're, it's, it's come together, but we're still kind of making it, creating it. The goal is still kind of blurry. And I feel like once we unblur that or, sharpen it was if we have a goal you know like you said it and if you have a, a why or you know what i'm talking about man who has a why can deal with any how oh I'm nietzsche first, first anyone first who has a why can um no. can figure out the how that's all i had Now I'll be quiet now because I've been taking up way too much air time. Did we lose Brian? I took up so much air time I scared him off. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. <laughs> Thank you.
be Rob more apt to be. <laughs> Give him just a second. I'm going to bet he somehow lost connection there. Bjorn, you were referencing Nietzsche. He who has a why to live for, for can bear almost anyhow, I think is how it goes. Yes, ma'am. That's it right there. You knew. You, you knew. Thank you for helping me out there. No problem. I'm a big Nietzsche fan. One of my. Uh, Lutitia and uh, Melissa, uh, whenever you guys were referencing the introvert and extrovert that uh, my son had said where those overlap, that's the framework we're looking to build. Oh, that's great. Yeah, me and Melissa are a powerhouse when we're together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm introverted until I get around people. Like I'm, a, I'm the quiet hermit. I don't want to leave the house, but uh, whenever I get out, I'm very uh, social butterfly. I, I'm a social butterfly only when I know people. Uh, yeah. If I don't, if I don't know them, I'm, I'm, uh, eh, I'm okay. But uh, yeah, if I know you, I'll talk your ear off. Extroverted introvert. Huh. I said you're a bunch of extroverted introverts. Oh yeah, I'm more comfortable at home. Uh -huh. You know, uh, something it kind of reminds me of, uh, Tisha, you talking talking about how you and Melissa are a powerhouse with those disparate elements. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the interplay of Muspelheim and and uh, Niflheim, where uh, they come together to create this beautiful world, but they're like horrendously terrible places to go anywhere near. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, don't come out. Don't come out with that stuff. You know that our events are good. We feed you and Melissa entertains you. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I know you. Yeah, yeah. But uh, also, also really, that? like, the, the common theme, <laughs> the common theme uh, that I'm seeing here is, like, when you have things that are too extreme in different directions and they, they interplay, something good can come out of it. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. and Bjorn, uh, I wanted to make a point to you as well. Um, you had said, um, you know, that we need to figure out how to come and work together. Um, I got to tell you, when uh, our folk get together, um, Terry can attest to it. Um, Shay can attest to it. And when we get together, everybody just falls naturally into their spaces where they're the, their strengths. And it, and it all is symbiotic the way it all works together. Um, and I think that happens at almost every event I've ever gone to, whether it be a national AFA event or if it's just in the backyard. Um, it's amazing how when like-minded folk get together, how immediately everything just works and gets done. Absolutely. I totally I, agree with you. Everything about the AFA you said is right. They're the most solid, wholesome people I've ever known. I suppose I was speaking from being scarred by parental figures that were extremely libertarian and Christian, which means they eventually had no standards, but had standards at the same time, but they didn't hold them up to themselves. They were just entirely Hippocratic. It's a really weird mind fuck to get out of that. A lot, I think a lot of us went through, especially in America. But I, I didn't, but I, I've seen it. I think some people that I have known and seen the highly individualistic, you know, libertarian usually, take it too far for my comfort and I, I that's where my reference was coming from not from sure. individuals within the afa because you guys are solid i, I think that happened. right i think that christians well they're taught to be that way okay um it's not us it's them we're not the centers they're the centers we're saved they're not it's it's a it's all a um you know a repetition of you know making us you know we're the the sons and daughters of a king right and who doesn't get a big ass head with that thought process and then you know you're you're the insider looking out at that point right and you're like all of those centers and that's how they mind control you right that way that you know you'll still give them your 10 percent every week you'll trip in i'll be familiar 
I wanted to bring up a point real quick before we are going to have to end pretty pretty and pretty soon here. Brian's actually lost all of his the ability to connect tonight but before i do that because we're still recording and i'm sure he's going to go back and see the end conversation parts um when we're talking about that how and how we come together as a as a community i just want to state this so we are inherently tribal people inherently tribal and when Letitia talked about how when we come together, we just naturally kind of fall into our rules. It's that it's that part that's so important. So like sometimes when we're lost and we're alone and then we find people and we start seeing how uh, everything is interacting and oh my God, they have some of the same beliefs as us. And then you find your role inside that community and you become better. And not only do you become better, but the other people around you do too, because you want to be worthy of the people that you are standing with and they want to be worthy of the things that you are doing and so it drives us to be a better community when we have gone through all the times of pack in history even where they split us apart but we lost that we weren't the, uh, the best versions of ourselves and we see how even in the last hundred years when they did it here in communities, everybody used to know their neighbor. They would know their neighbor, they would know what their struggles were, they would know what their, their, their children's names were, and now they don't. They don't know who lives next door to them. They don't know why that woman across the street's porch is falling apart because she's been sick for months and she can't do anything about it. And so they don't go over and they don't offer to help fix it. You know what I mean? They don't fall into their roles inside of their community the way that they used to. And so now coming back in, Asatru and the way that our faith is gives us the chance to do that. Even if it's not our direct neighbor sometimes, we hope it is too. You always wanna leave the community you live in better than what you found it, no matter where that is, whether that's your wider world community, or whether that's the place where you live, where your home is at. But, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I could go on about that for days because it's a really big thing to me. I kind of see the big picture. That's that's my thing in life. I see the tapestry. I know all the threads are there and those are really cool. But yeah, anyway, um, so I'm going to let <laughs> you guys know. If you guys have something to comment on that, you can. But otherwise, uh, if you don't, we're probably going to end up cutting this off for the night. And then we're going to pick this conversation up next week where we left off. Thanks, How Melissa. <laughs> you're welcome can i do a popcorn crush question real quick just just because i got all, all you'll hear sure i think it'd be an interesting thought experiment question to each one of you do you think we're in the age of ragnarok and if so why just just curious go for it i think that's a yes i think the ragnarok is cyclical i don't think it's a one-time event because Ragnarok comes when everything is destroyed and then we have to rebuild it. I would agree with what Melissa just said there. And I would also agree that the fact that we're even here trying to better ourselves and maybe be a part of fighting against all the chaos, you know, that's a feather in our cap, whatever happens. Yeah, I would third that. Um, uh, basically, to me, a straightforward reading of the Voluspa seems to suggest that right now we're still in the time that they referred to as the Wolf Age or the Wind Age. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it is a cyclical thing and there's cycles within cycles, of course. But if you want to think of it in terms of like a grand scale, um, which would, of course, somewhat oversimplify things. I think Ragnarok is still yet to come. Um, and so we still have a lot of preparation to do for it. Um, I think if anything is our religious duty, it's preparation for Ragnarok. You guys are food for my spirit, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You guys have all got a different outlook on Ragnarok than I do, but I don't think we want to get into my outlook of it, but I believe that it's more of an internal thing than it is an external thing. Um, and yes, I believe that if you looked at it as an external thing, we are in the age of Ragnarok. 
But you look at it an internal thing, I think that that's more of uh, you need to think about yourself and where you are in your life. And are you rebuilding who you are or are you comfortable with who you are? Things like that. I definitely think it's both, right? Yeah, I'd say as it comes, you know, no, just mainly because, you know, everything wanes and ebbs, civilizations, everything, you know, in life wanes and ebbs doesn't mean that it's, you know, going to go, you know, a complete downward turn because there's always a, there's always a break before that. And you see that with most, you know, civilizations, most things in nature, you know, you'll see in a forest, it'll start to get diseased or something like that, and it'll have a burnout. And then, you know, from that, you know, the rest of the forest is fine. And eventually that part of the forest is, you know, fine over time. Excellent points, you guys, today. Thanks for the great conversation. I hope everybody got a lot of good stuff out of that. <laughs> oh, it was great actually being on one of these things, you know. It's been a long time. Fantastic. Well, there's more to come. So we're going to meet back here next week. Same bat time, same bat station. <laughs> All right. Hail the folk. Hail the AFA. Hail the gods. Hail the folk, you guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Love y'all. Bye, guys. Bye. Everybody. Bye.